think uh, we can start uh, streaming. I think 14 are there in the YouTube. Uh, maybe one in one minute, possibly. Uh, we can send reminder to all other wherever we have sent the flyer, possibly. Or you can wait for five, 10 minutes now. Yeah, we can. Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Okay, so we are live. We are live. Yeah, 3.40 we can start. 10 minutes you can wait, so they are the kids, no? they can join. Margi also joined. <laughs> <laughs> So we can wait wait for 10 minutes, no? We should wait for 10 minutes, no? Abhijit? Yeah, yeah, I think we can wait for maybe uh, five minutes or five minutes. Wait, kar lete. I think it's streaming. Anil, are you streaming now? Yeah, yes, yes. OK, so it is live now. OK, so let us wait for five minutes. OK. <laughs>
Good, good afternoon to one and all present here. Uh, first of all, I would like to wish you all a very happy Basant Panchami. And with me today, we have our Honorable Director, Dr. P.C. Pancharya. We have our uh, Skill Development Team Head, Dr. Avijit Karmakar. We have Dr. Pramod Tamar, Mr. Navjot Kumar, and we have Dr. Madan. And uh, today we are here for the very first lecture, the series of popular lecture under Jigyasa. And with this, I would like to request our Honorable Director to speak a few words about C and uh, about the program. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vijay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Abhijit Karmakar, Head Jigyasa and Skill Program of CSIR Siri. Dr. Paramod, all the speakers, today's speaker, Naujot Kumar, Dr. Madan, and all the students who have joined this program online. So our target is students, and you know that Jigyasa is a very nice program for all the students across India. And CSIR started this program. And we are also conducting the same program in CSIR series. Under Jigyasa programs, we are also adapting uh, three, four uh, schools nearby Pilani and providing help to all these schools in form of electronics, in form of lectures, IT facilities. So as you know that Jigyasa meaning is curiosity. And curiosity is the basic step for innovation. So if you want to adopt a career in science and technology, then you should have a Jigyasa. Jigyasa to solve science, Jigyasa to make systems, make a technology. So the basic requirement is Jigyasa. Today is a festival day. The Basant Panchmi. This is in honor of uh, Goddess Saraswati. And after today, Basant Panchmi, the 40th day will be the Holi. So this is also known as start and preparation of Holi festival because uh, it's a arrival of a new season. Spring is coming. So. This is a festival and in the festival season and our both speakers, they're ready for that delivering a lecture to you all. So with these few words, I thank you Jigyasa team for inviting me and the speakers here for this program. So with blessing of Goddess Saraswati, all what we are doing in our life or endeavors in education, in career, we will be successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. And uh, hope we will we'll take the legacy of Siri and our, our team ahead. And that too, like empowering students to learn many new things with this program. Now I would like to request Dr. Avijit Karmakar to say a few words in this context. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vijay. First of all, uh, good afternoon to one and all. Dr. Pancharya, thank you for your time. Uh, all my students uh, connected through YouTube and uh, my scientist uh, colleagues and teachers all connected through MS team and uh, through YouTube. We are about to start uh, series Jigyasa lecture series 2022. Uh, I'll just very briefly give you a background of uh, this uh, Jigyasa uh, program. Uh, this program was initiated in 2017 during uh, CSIR's Platinum Jubilee uh, celebration year. <clears throat> so the initiative uh, was primarily to widen and deepen the scientific social responsibility of CSIR uh, scientists primarily by fostering the culture of uh, curious uh, curiousness among students. Uh, Dr. Banchar has already mentioned, uh, talked about it. It is a very unique platform uh, which also uh, tries to bring scientists and uh, teachers together 
for nurturing the young minds. Through this uh, program, we also open up our facilities, the scientific facilities to school children. Uh, you know, to uh, enabling our CSI scientific knowledge base and facility to be utilized by uh, school children all across the, our country. Some of the programs were very popular in past, uh, you know, past uh, around five years, like lab visit, then popular lecture series, and these are all spread throughout our country because we have the spread of around 40 labs throughout our country as CSI as a whole. So the summer vacation programs were also, we also did in Pilani also. Scientists at, and teachers and teachers as scientists was another uh, program. Then student residential program was their visit of scientists to schools where they are. Then recently one more initiative is added that is CSI virtual labs. Okay, today there are uh, two uh, programs, uh, two lectures, uh, 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 two lectures, popular lectures and uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Vijay to just uh, 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 tell the students about the topics. And uh, okay, again, I welcome uh, you all. And uh, Vijay, please take it up from here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, before I will uh, introduce our first speaker today, uh, there is an uh, like uh, advice for the student. Uh, meanwhile, you can type your question in the chat box in YouTube. And hopefully by the end of uh, the lecture, the speaker will address to the queries that you have during his lecture. So with this word, I would like to introduce our first speaker to you all. Uh, he's uh, Mr. Navjot Kumar. He is working as a senior scientist in Dairy and Food Instrumentation Division and presently in Jaipur Center of CSR Siri. He received B.Tech EC degree from College of Engineering, Punjabi University, PU, Patiala in 2011 and M.Tech an advanced electronic system from Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, ACSIR, Chennai in 2013. Currently, he is pursuing his PhD. He was a recipient of Quick Hire Scientist Trainee Fellowship by CSIR during 2011 to 2014. He is engaged in various R&D projects related to food and consumer safety solutions, affordable technologies for quality assessment of milk, software for milk supply chain, monitoring and honey quality, etc. His research area includes instrumentation and embedded systems, signal conditioning, circuits for sensors, infrared spectroscopy based measurement techniques, multivariate data analysis based on chemometrics technique for qualitative and quantitative analysis in food and agriculture sector. He has published more than three book chapters, 16 research papers, and general articles in various scientific reports and conferences. The webinar will focus basically uh, with artificial sensing system with an overview of electronic tongue and electronic nose. With this, I request Mr. Navjot to please continue with his lecture. Thank you very much, Navjot, please. Thank you, Vijay. Um, just I'm sharing my slide now. Uh, are my slides visible to yeah, all? Yes, 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 absolutely okay. Uh, okay uh, Respected Director, sir, uh, Dr. Abhijit Karmakar, sir, uh, Chief Scientist, CSIR, or my colleagues and dear students who are uh, linked to us through YouTube. Uh, my name is Navjot Kumar, has already been introduced by Vijay. So, as a part of this Chigyasa program, uh, I am delivering a very brief lecture on artificial sensing system where we will be mainly focusing on electronic tongue and electronic nose. Uh, let me begin my uh, talk by asking a very basic question. Like in, in daily routine, we, we usually all consume tea, coffee or milk or the packaged uh, juices, uh, even the drugs. So the basic question here is that, that how can we be sure about the authenticity of these all uh, food items that we are consuming on the daily basis. So the answer to it is that the government has already provided uh, a network of food test laboratories across the country and one can go and submit their sample to them and they will test it uh, by charging some of the fees for it. But the only issue, the basic issue here is that usually 
they take around 2 to 3 days uh, to test it and generate a report uh, for the samples which we are submitting now just assume that somebody has uh, taken milk and he has submitted it to some of the food test laboratories and after 2 or 3 days the report comes which says that there was a urea in it so there was adulteration with the milk now assume that you have already consumed that milk two days back and after two days it is saying that the, there was a urea which you have consumed. So from a consumer point of view, so there is a some issue. Now what are the basic ways by which you can uh, you know judge the quality of your food stuff and what are the uh, methods which are adopted by industry and some of the uh, uh, different food test laboratories. The first is human sensory analysis uh, based test. So there are basically trained human tasters. So I will be talking about it a little bit in, in few in short time. So there are trained human tasters. So let us say for tea industry or wine industry or even for the milk at the milk collection centers, you will usually find human tasters. So they will drink it and on the basis of its taste. So they will judge the quality of the uh, food item. Similarly, there can be chemical uh, based method and spectroscopic based methods also, but all these techniques have certain pros and cons associated with it. So we'll be looking into that as well. Let us say uh, when it comes to you know human senses, so we are blessed with five basic uh, uh, senses. So we can see, we can smell, so we can taste, we can perceive information through our touch, and we can hear as well. So using all these basic senses uh, that we human possess, the human certain human trained person are there at the industry level as I give an example for tea industry. So they will taste it or by looking at the color of the tea, for example, or uh, tasting it or smelling uh, based on the smell of the tea sample. So they will uh, they'll be grading the quality of the tea. But the issue here comes is there is always a problem with the reproducibility of the uh, evaluation because for example, if we are talking about the taste, so taste is a very particular attribu attribute which belongs to one particular person. The same taste can be liked by one person and same taste can be uh, cannot be liked by other person. Although these human tasters are very trained persons, so they, they have been trained to give unbiased opinion. But in, in when, we are, when, we are, when we are talking about giving a, a grade, a, a quantitative number to a particular item, then you will see that there is always an involvement of fuzziness when it comes to human sensory analysis. So there is a problem of uh, uh, reproducibility of the results when we are talking about human sensory analysis. So there is an issue associated with this method also. The remaining methods which we said are chemical based or spectroscopy based. There is no doubt that these are most powerful techniques you know, and you can do the component level analysis through these techniques. The issue is there, there these are time consuming. They are very uh, uh, high end. There is a requirement of high end equipments which are costly. And uh, it usually requires a very skilled person to perform the test, just like it is uh, it is being done at the food test laboratories across the country. So I have given an example. Let us say you have submitted to the laboratory and after three days you are knowing that sample was bad. So this kind of issues are always with uh, it. Then how can we solve this problem? You know. At a consumer level, the answer comes to artificial sensing method. So as I mentioned before, there are five basic senses. So through any set of sensors or electronics means or through any measurement science, if you can replace these basic five senses and you power it through AI based algorithms, then you can replace the idea is to replace this human sensory uh, panel based test through a device, through a machine which can sense just like we human are doing. Let us say for uh, for, e -no, uh, for for nose, you can replace it with electronic nose and it can make a decision based on our past memories, just like those trained human tasters were doing through AI and on the spot it can give a decision for the food item. It should not take around you know, two, three days. After two, three days, we are, get, uh, uh, we are getting the results out of it. So this is the basic idea behind this artificial sensing method. So as I was talking about, there are five basic senses for let us say smell. You can replace it through electronic nose for taste. There are electronic tongue for vision. There are cameras 
similarly for touch based sensing there are tactile sensor and there are sound sensor for hearing it for this uh, in this scope of this lecture we are basically will be focusing on electronic nose and electronic tongue uh, i'll begin with electronic nose as the alexander graham well has said that if you are ambitious to find a new science you measure a smell so there is a lot of information when we are talking about uh, when if you can sample the smell of the sample then there is you can create a lot of ai based models and you can create a lot of information out of it just by through the smell of it as the name itself is saying electronic nose so the basic idea is that you have to create a system you have to build a system which can mimic the human olfactory system which is existing with us human for example if you have to identify a certain gas uh, i'll i can give you an exact example also let us say in mines you know so usually we deploy a system to uh, measure certain gases such as carbon monoxide or methane or uh, in detection of explosives also you know these kind of systems are used so through these gas sensors you can sample the air you can sample the smell and you can uh, power it through the ai and you can come to a conclusion just like we humans are doing so this is the basic idea behind e nose now talking about if we compare it with uh, the basic uh, olfaction sensors of olfaction which we human are possessing so there is a nasal cavity and followed by the olfactory neurons then olfactory bulbs the air which suck through our nasal cavity then it flow it go, the the information is acquired by these olf olfactory neurons and bulb a particular spectrum a particular signature is created into our brain so our brain based on our past experiences it judges on the basis of this acquired uh, signal which goes to our brain and it comes to a conclusion whether the smell is pleasant or unpleasant or whether it, this particular smell belongs to some particular category or not now to mimic this system uh, we can also design a system with following block diagram uh, with, with the following blocks the first will be odor handling system just like the we are having the nasal cavity where we are sucking the air so there will be odor handling handling system which will be comprising of through certain air pumps and uh, valves so this air uh, this uh, odor handling system can deliver the air to the electronic sensor array where the signal will be sampled and through some pre processing signal circuits it will go to our cpu or microcontroller or any processing unit you know so in the microcontroller or cpu we can have already trained ai based algorithms which will acquire this uh, data or information from the sensor and it will judge uh, let us say whether it is for classification or whether it is for quantification where you have to give a number for the quality of the any sample which is under test so it can make a judgment using this ai based method so this is a very brief idea of e nose although there are lot of challenges which are involved with it Uh, for example the repetitive repetitivity of the sensors those challenges are always there but this is the basic building di uh, block diagram by which one can design an electronic nose which can work exactly how our human nose work so this is the idea from uh, for this uh, particular slide which i wanted to convey to the students uh this is uh, i will very briefly talk about this also this is a block uh, system which we designed at our siri uh, lab so here is a sensor chamber where we deployed 10 different uh, gas sensors so uh, at the le extreme left there is a uh, sample holder where we place the sample uh, for the measurement through this micro pump we have designed this order handling system through this pumps and pinch wall followed by this pump which actually uh, delivers the air from this sample holder to sample chamber uh, this sensor chamber and the uh, signal uh, the air is sampled by the sensors and the data is delivered to here the computer system so at the computer system we have already uh, designed ai based algorithms there it can judge a different kind of smells and it can classify based on the smell itself i'll give you another example at the input we have provided these three different samples ethanol methanol and isopropyl alcohol and these are the responses from these samples corresponding to each uh, sample uh, let us say we were using 10 different sensor so this is from s1 s2 s3 followed by up to s10 
so these are this is the typical spectra which we received at the computer end and the algorithm has classified these different samples into different sets for example these five dots represents a measurement from ethanol so this is just to gives you glimpses that how one can dis, uh, design a system uh, which can work exactly like our human nose uh, uh, how our human nose behaves and we can classify or quantify different different uh, samples and we can solve lot of real life problems also uh, now coming to the summary of e nose uh, when we are talking about olfactory receptor in our human nose we have sensor array in real life through which we can replace it at the olfactory bulb level we have uh, we come to a circuit level there we will use certain processing and signal conditioning circuitry then at the brain end where we take a decision we can replace it with the artificial intelligence based algorithms then uh, we can completely replace the system through electronics means so this is what i wanted to convey to the students now there are certain application for this enos uh, such that it can be used to monitor the quality of the air or environment around us and uh, it can uh, it can be used to uh, determine the quality for uh, beverages and drinks that we are having for the military use also it's been used uh, through uh, explosive detection and certain medical uses are also there uh, now coming to the second system which is electronic tongue so the idea is same here that how can we design a system which can mimic the human tongue like in human tongue we have uh, basic five uh, tastes bitter sour salt sweet and umami then we can utilize just like we were utilizing gas sensor there here we can utilize certain electrodes which can be dipped into the uh, sample liquid sample and it can acquire the signals out of it based on the taste uh, we can call it as a taste sensors uh, there are certain techniques which are already there in the literature i need not to mention it also potentiometry voltammetry chemical sensor chips based there are certain good amount of literature and techniques are available uh, which are already people have utilized to design this electronic tongue i'll be particularly very briefly talking about this voltammetry so so just like in e nose we were using uh, gas sensors here we use electrodes so then in a typical voltammetry setup there are three different electrodes so one is called working electrode reference electrode and third one is called uh, counter electrode so in what we do in multi voltammetry is that we apply a voltage signal here between working and counter electrode and we perform a measurement from here between working and reference electrode so you apply a signal here and corresponding to that we measure a signal from this between these two electrodes and based is on this uh, 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 when we apply a signal uh, on working electrode and uh, uh, counter electrode so there is a certain reaction which occurs on the working electrode or based on this reactions so there is a kind of signal that we we can acquire from uh, between these working and reference and on this acquired spectra we can apply a machine learning based algorithm so this is the basic idea behind it this is the typical experimental setup which uh, which people have used uh, just like the for the taste sensors there are set of working electrodes so there the reaction will be occurring and here is a reference electrode through which we will be measuring the uh, spectra measuring the data and potential state is there to execute this reaction just like we were saying now we have to apply a voltage and acquire a data so all this procedure is managed by the potential state and then we have a data acquisition system and computer where we can uh, where our algorithms will work and they will uh, either classify it or quantify it based on the application uh i will just wanted to give you this one example this is our director sir's invention itself it's called shear scanner so here uh siri has utilized e tongue based measurement to detect if there is any adulteration in the milk samples for example it can detect urea salt detergent soap soda if anybody will add any even a minimum amount of this urea up to 1 gram in 1 liter it can easily detect so these are based on taste sensor itself what we are talking about as electronic tongue so instead of uh, human tasters we have replaced it by the electronic tongue there it can detect it, these adulterants in 40 seconds itself you know unlikely what we were discussing that if you give it to the labs you will get the result after 2 3 days so here on spot 
you can detect whether the sample is adulterated or not. So if it is adulterated, it is not meant to be consumed. It has to be discarded. So this is one system which Siri has uh, developed based on, on based on e tongue system. Now just by summary of it, just like in our tongue we have taste buds. Here one can utilize different different electrodes or taste sensors at the receptor level. Similarly, we have the nervous system which takes the signal from our tongue to our brain. Then there at the circuit level, you, we are having transducer, uh, transducer and signal conditioning uh, circuits. Then just like in ENOS, uh, when it comes to a decision making, we can replace it by through a certain pattern recognition technique or AI based techniques. There we can have a decision uh, using this uh, for whether you have to detect some contamination in the sample or not. So that this all decision can be made through this statistical means. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. So if there are any questions, um, I can answer. Yeah, thank you very much, much uh, for your uh, topic and your very uh, like deeply motivation, motivational talk. I have one question from the student side. Somebody asked, what is urea? Uh, urea, usually you know what happens at the farmer level or industrial level also. When you, uh, at the collection center, you know, when farmer takes the milk at the collection center, so there are certain uh, these urea or salt, everything they add it as an adulterant. So urea is acting as an adulterant in the milk. So urea is usually used by the farmers. Uh, field may they put it. So this is not meant to be consumed by human beings. So this urea, when by adding this urea or salt or detergent, basically what it does is it enhances the uh, milk quality parameters. Let us say fat or SNF will, will be increased. So the, by adding this kind of things into the milk, it will uh, generate more profit even for the farmer also, even for the industry also. That is why to increase this quality parameters of the milk, they add these kind of things into. Urea, they add urea, they add sugar, they add salt, they add detergent. So these kind of adulterant they add into the milk. Thank you. Um, next question I have from Sunil is, uh, please explain what are the applications of ENO system in food quality monitoring? Uh, there are certain uh, applications. Uh, for example, uh, we have also conducted certain experiments where we will, you know, uh, boil the milk and we will sample that, uh, you know, odor which is coming out from the milk. And then we, we conducted this experiment whether we can detect the adulteration from this odor itself. So this kind of application, there are a lot of applications using this. Similarly, for wine quality. So based on the smell itself, one can judge what is the quality of the wine. Similarly for tea, in tea industry also the human tasters are there. They taste it also, they smell it also. So based on the smell and taste, they combinedly give a grade to the quality, quality for the tea industry. One more question. What are the sensors used in ENOS and how they sense? Uh, typically, there is there is a, there is not a specific question uh, to this. Uh, there is no specific answer to this question. There are broadly broad categories of sensor which are available. But uh, uh, for example, if you in the mines, if you are uh, measuring, uh, you are detecting carbon monoxide. So for there are certain sensor from IR based technology is also there. Uh, made on, based on metal oxide sensor, also you can measure it. So there are variety of sensors. It totally depends upon the application that uh, which kind of sensors you want to use. In generic, mostly in the uh, application, people have utilized metal oxide sensor. This is the most popular sensors which people have used to design ENOS. So I think uh, we have no more questions. Thank you very much, Navjot, for your interesting talk. I think uh, our student will gain maximum from his talk and uh, if at all you have some other queries, you can always reach to him. We will provide uh, his email address and uh, hope uh, it's been a very uh, learning exercise for all of us. Thank you, Navjot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Vijay. Thank you. Uh, now with this, I would like to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, his name is Dr. Madan Kumar Lashmanan. He is a senior scientist in CSIR Siri, presently located in Chennai. 
Formerly as a researcher at the Delft University of Technology, the Netherlands, he developed advanced wireless multi-rate communication systems based on wavelet transform and digital filter banks. He has received numerous awards, including including the NET Net Telecom Award presented uh, to the most innovative PhD thesis work in the Netherlands in the field of telecommunication. He did his bachelor's in ECE from the University of Madras with a distinction. MS in telecommunication with Summa Cum Laude and PhD in electrical engineering from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He has been part of various scientific projects of societal interest. He has also executed industrial projects for multinationals such as Samsung, NEC Japan, Mega Agress Germany, Dutch Research Delta Netherlands, and Marico India. His current technical interests are related to the data processing of biomedical signals for health monitoring through contact uh, wearable devices and contactless uh, video processing sensors and application of AI based spectroscopic methods for the material component analysis of polymer. Today, he will talk about a very important topic. We all are uh, aware of this thing, but how uh, scientifically we can approach for a solution. So the topic he will be talking is importance and challenges of plastic waste recycling. So over to you, Madan. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vijay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Director. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear Karmakar sir, uh, head PBD, uh, colleagues from our CD fraternity, CSCR fraternity, and uh, welcome all junior uh, children. So I'll just uh, open my slides in a moment. I hope it's uh, visible. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, yes, yes, it is visible. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, title of the talk and the theme is uh, on a very relevant topic, which is the challenges and importance of uh, plastic waste recycling. As the image itself depicts, uh, today we are uh, kind of in a mess with regard to the excessive usage of plastic. On the other side, we have not come out with adequate uh, technologies to reuse them or uh, dispose them in a suitable manner. So it has four broad parts. First, uh, entirely out of scientific interest, uh, we will talk about what uh, plastics are and how they are made into different products. <clears throat> Next is a glimpse of the havoc cast by plastics. Uh, then we will look into why plastics are so difficult to recycle. This is something we should all be aware of. And uh, the solution that our institution has attempted over the years to mitigate the problem of uh, waste plastics. So I hope uh, it will form an interesting theme for all you listeners. So I'll uh, touch upon the first part, which is the introduction of plastics. So, Plastics are basically synthetic materials uh, that is like unlike uh, the wood item or the metals, iron or aluminium that uh, we may come across in nature. These are uh, not available in nature as such, but are made by scientists in laboratories by combining different chemicals. <clears throat> they are very, very popular from a manufacturing standpoint of view because one can make them in huge quantities very quickly with very less uh, wastage during manufacturing. They can be easily transported from one place to other. Uh, they are uh, non-corrosive, they don't get rusted, and they have excellent electrical insulation properties. And uh, many times they are also as strong as uh, many other uh, items that uh, we may come across. And most importantly, they can be turned into different shapes forms, sizes, so therefore their uses are very, very diverse. There are very many kinds of uh, plastic polymers. I mean, you must have heard of uh, pet bottles, which in which you would be carrying water, the distillery bottles, the Sprite and Pepsi Coke bottles are also made of pet bottles. 
and there are other kinds of plastics like high density polyethylene low density polyethylene what i would recommend all you children is that uh, go home take any plastic object you may have and then close the lid so so that uh, it doesn't pour when you and then tilt it in the bottom you will see a triangle uh, with the different numbers so you may start this exercise look at these uh, different items in your uh, house that you may use plastic tubes or other items that are there and many instances they come out with these numbers 1 2 3 4 which uh, denote a particular kind of plastic <clears throat> so the point i would like to emphasize here is that there are different kinds of plastics just as there are different kinds of metals like gold and aluminum and silver and iron there are different kinds of plastics and each one of them have different chemical properties different physical properties and hence are used for different applications starting from bottles to paper cups or to cups to plates and what not and all these plastic items also have different chemical structure some of them which are simple and others which are complicated so i'll delve a bit more on how they are made in the next coming slides and this is a very quick statistics of where exactly plastics are used today anywhere from 38 35 to 40% is used in packaging items some are used in construction some are used in textile you may be surprised many of it's cold out in north india and many of your uh, jerkins are, are made from different uh, polymers uh, polyester primarily is a very common item used in electrical appliances and so on and so forth so it's a very popular uh, material for a range of uh, applications and uh, uh, for the right or for the wrong the use of plastics isn't going to go down anytime soon but the critical point is how are plastics made where do we actually get them from so it all started millions and millions of years ago when uh, uh, many plants and animals or phytoplanktons and zooplanktons in the oceans and sea died and then sedimented at the bottom of the sea basically and then there uh, over years and decades and centuries and thousands of years you had uh, mud covering on these uh, dead plants and animals and then pressure is exerted by the ocean itself and then under pressure through a very very complicated process which scientists are still trying to understand uh, we get uh, the uh, petroleum or crude oil uh, that is uh, sedimented in the bottom of oceans and other places and from there uh, people try to identify where these crude oil are deposited and then they extract through a complicated procedure uh, through oil rigs and other advanced machinery and then this oil is then transported to various places through conventional modes or uh, through laying of pipes or through ships and other means sometimes you also can have oil on the land itself in, the, in which case it's called a oil well so when it's under the ocean it's called a oil rig when it's under on, on the land it's called oil well and then uh, even in gujarat and andhra and many parts of india uh, people are said to have found uh, deposits of uh, these oil and then once in the oil refinery you have uh, complicated machinery some of you who may be in class 10 would have come up, come across this process called refraction where the crude oil is actually uh, heated in a furnace and at, at different layers of the furnace you have different uh, chemicals uh, which uh, sediment which become gas and then they have different melting point and boiling point and then one can uh, differentiate and then extract different chemicals from these crude oils so now we have these chemicals so some of these chemicals are chosen for their properties other they do empirical 
studies and then through studies they identify which one is which but the point is that uh, these chemicals are basically uh, simple chemicals and from here we have to get polymers so this is going to happen in the lab of uh, chemist uh, through a process called polymerization so here we have shown a simple example of how ethane which is a monomer is converted into uh, polythene which uh, we use popularly in uh, milk covers in south india and other plastic covers in the rest of the country basically so that's how we get the plastic polymer basically from crude oil or petroleum uh, they are moved to refineries from which uh, from where the chemicals are extracted and uh, through a chemical process uh, the monomers are converted into polymers so we have polymers proper and these polymers usually come in the form of small granules of different uh, sizes and shape and of different materials so once we have these granules there are different uh, mechanical manufacturing process where they are heated and then put in a mold compressed into uh, different shapes or there is a process called injection molding where it is injected into a mold cavity in a liquefied format and then it takes the shape of the mold and then there are other methods like how bottles are made through what is called blow molding where uh, inside the mold uh, it, the plastic is uh, put inside and then it through a process of extrusion called blow extrusion it's uh, converted into the shape of plastics similarly you if you want wanted buyers or pipes or other plastic items one can apply what is called a extrusion uh, molding uh, mechanism so in this process all the granules that we showed in the earlier slide become uh, different uh, plastic objects and then they are taken to factories and to retail shops and other shops where uh, we people go and buy items that are of interest to us so that's the life cycle of how plastics are born now the flip side which is that we use plastics we find them convenient but then we don't we just dump them outside just like we dump any organic substances <clears throat> now this has kind of uh, mounted over the decades that we have used and then um, uh, yeah, these statistics are five years old and at that point in time it was about 6.3 billion tons uh, about 80 percent was still dumped and unused and people say that the weight of plastics that are left unused or not recycled can be up to 1 billion african elephants and just for your information this is what uh, african elephant looks like it's not even an indian elephant it is um, massive one and a half times more massive than an indian elephant and uh, as on date uh, 1 billion plastics or 1 billion weights of such elephants are uh, littered everywhere in the globe basically and even in the oceans uh, plastics are dumped in various forms as on date people say that for every three fish that is out there one item is a plastic item and by 2050 there will be more plastic items in the oceans than there are uh, the fish kinds that exist and even in india the numbers are very very uh, we actually use significantly lower amount of plastics but even then there are about uh, 1.5 million tons of plastic waste generated every year that is a, the weight of more than 200 eiffel towers or 30 titanic so the numbers are significant and actually they cause harm in various ways uh, people don't have space to kind of put these plastics so they find large areas and then they dump them there and then they remain in the soil for decades if not centuries and then even in the oceans they we, we have seen pathetic pictures of animals and fishes and tortoise getting caught in uh, plastic nets and more importantly they are carriers of many infections 
and um, yeah. there, there are other impacts also like sometimes the livestock cow and other animals eat these plastics and this was one example which we found uh, many years ago of uh, uh, people operating cows and they found 25 kilos of uh, plastic uh, waste inside the cow unfortunately the cow also died in this instance and these are other images where uh, a dead bird's whole body has plastics inside so the picture is very very grim and in fact uh, people say there is one entire island made of plastics in the pacific ocean which is called the great garbage pacific gyre and uh, people these are images from that gyre where you have plastics practically everywhere and to humans and animals uh, many infections and diseases uh, which are very very new i mean for example cancer is a very very recent it's it's been there for a while but in the recent past it's become taken a very deadly shape with a lot of people being infected with cancer endocrine problems skin problems and other problems also <clears throat> so it is uh, a grim picture and then um, every one of us is aware of uh, the impact to varying degrees but the question that remains in every one of our minds is why can't we just uh, kind of remove these plastics once for all why is it so hard so there are many reasons for that the primary reason is that the waste plastic is very hard to access i mean very near my house 2 3 kilometers away we have a uh marsh land which in traditional times we had a lot of uh, birds coming migratory birds coming from europe from other places but these days these are very very sparse because very near to the marsh land we have the landfill where the plastics are all dumped so the marsh land is entirely entirely contaminated by these plastics and they are very very hard to extract i mean they are soiled with mud and debris and dirt and it's practically impossible even for a municipality to go at a large scale and then remove the garbage and then extract the plastics the second thing is that they are contaminated with bio substances i mean we have bottles filled with uh, uh, dahi and other things achar and they are already soiled with these bio substances and then they have to be clean properly before they can be segregated and then removed so contaminated plastics are very very hard to recycle the third thing is that even mixed plastics are difficult to uh, process and then recycle uh, i'll tell you why what i mean by mixed plastics so in this case this is a plastic yard which where <clears throat> people from houses collect largely clean plastics but when they are collected they are stored in huge bales running into thousands and thousands of kilos fine and then uh, there they are mixed with other plastics a plastic cover with a plastic bottle uh, a pvc pipe and what not sometimes there are also metallic aluminum and other metallic uh, remnants so it's an extremely difficult uh, problem to get out the plastics that we want to recycle and recycling of mixed plastics is very very hard for example if we take polyvinyl chloride you can see the chemical structure of that it has chloride atom in the polymer so chloride atom when we mix with hydrocarbons at high temperatures can lead to hydrochloric acid which we all know is extremely corrosive and dangerous every week or so we hear in newspapers about a pyrolysis plant having some blast or some some loud noise coming out primarily because of pvc samples which get into the recycling process leading to hcl leading to these uh, extreme situations other scenarios are that even what we have as a very very uh, common pet bottle the bottle that we have has oxygen atoms in the polymer so when we do pyrolysis oxygen there can result in extreme combustion and then leading to explosion there too so the recycling process it's a very very sensitive process and therefore people have to take great care to ensure that the plastics are properly segregated they are not contaminated by dirt and debris they are not contaminated by any other 
items uh, that are there. So that's the major reason why recycling is uh, very, very hard. In the Indian context, uh, people have tried to try to sort different kinds of plastic. Largely it is done manually, meaning uh, people are trained to identify different plastics and then they are told to move different items into different bins. But of course there is always human error and people can get tired and then one plastic looks very similar to a different plastic item and therefore it's very, very hard to do it efficiently. There are other methods like gravity methods, electrostatic methods, froth flotation, but these are all extremely cumbersome, cumbersome, slow and uh, labor intensive. Therefore, it's very, very evident that there's a great need that we need a affordable and uh, efficient solution for a country like India where different kinds of plastics can be removed efficiently and then they can be sent into different recycling plants. So that's the major need of the hour. So in this context, our institution, CSER CD has invested a lot of time and energy and people have come out with a lot of interesting ideas. And one such idea is the use of near infrared spectroscopy, which even Naujot had touched upon in his, in his talk very, very briefly. So, but what is a near infrared spectrometer or a camera? Basically, you must all have come across different kinds of camera. Some of these uh, you must also be using uh, in your uh, smart uh, cell phone, smartphone, basically. Your parents must have had different models, models from Kodak and other companies. So, but we are aware of the normal camera. But there are other kinds of camera or spectrometer uh, which uh, work in a different uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation region. So here in this picture down below, you will see the VIPGR or the different colors of violet, indigo, blue, which we all must have read from our uh, young classes. But very near that in the electromagnetic spectra, there is a region called infrared, which again can be separated into different sub-regions called near infrared, mid IR, mid infrared and far IR. So in the NIR region, a scientist have come out with a lot of ideas for, for it to be used for various purposes. And more pertinently for uh, plastic classification and sorting, people have uh, shown that different plastics have different signatures in the NIR region. So it's like uh, different pigments have different colors in a similar way, different plastics have different uh, spectral signature. So therefore, just like how Naujos had talked about, uh, modern methods of data science, uh, it is called chemometrics in this field, and artificial intelligence can be applied to extract various information from these uh, spectra. So that's what uh, we are trying to do in a process called, roughly called pattern recognition where you have data, we remove noise from there, and we do some kind of data modeling, data science to extract information. And from there, we know which kind of plastics is which. And then once we have separated them, then we can send each of them to different uh, factory or recycling outlets for them to be made into recycled products. That's the whole idea. So this is a system that uh, we had envisaged in our laboratory it's a very, very system which uh, we are uh, hoping to con commercialize. So there is a small conveyor where the plastic items come one by one. And we have a NIR optical uh, arrangement here where the signatures of different plastics are collected. And then we have a computational module, a computer or other devices where the algorithms can be run. <clears throat> so I'll show you a very small a uh, demonstration of that. So just, oh yeah, it should be starting in a minute. Yeah. <clears throat> so as you can see on the conveyor, the objects keep coming one by one. And then we, the NIR uh, spectrometer collects the details. And then once it's certain that this object belongs to a particular kind, in this example, it's the pet object item. Uh, air is blown on the jet nozzle and then the object is moved into 
her respective bin. So this uh, invention of Siri has been recognized by the government and it has also won a runner up award uh, nearly a decade or so ago. So that is all I have uh, from my side. Uh, I'll be very happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, now I wish you all the very best for your studies, for your exams and for your career also. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Madan, for your very interesting topic. And also this topic is uh, related to all of us because this is a very big problem if we consider as a whole, not only in India, but as you say, like Pacific Ocean and other examples that you have said, it's really a very important problem to work upon. And uh, I have one question from students like, what are granules? Okay, I mean, <clears throat> Granules are small particles. So it's a small plastic polymer. So just like the beads that your mothers must have had to make mala, these are small plastic particles uh, which can be used uh, and then uh, to make uh, different kinds of plastic objects. So they are melted and then they are remade into different plastic objects. So a granule is a small, uh, like a bead, which is a small plastic uh, piece, if I may say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have one more question. What we have bulk of materials rather than a single PET bottles? How do you differentiate? Uh, yes. So the point is that at this point in time, our system is able to recognize uh, five kinds of plastic items. So ideally, we would want them to be separated on a conveyor and then be able to identify uh, different pieces at uh, different times. But the solution that we have here is a low cost one where if an object is placed one by one, it can identify. The video must have shown largely plastic bottles, but other small reasonably sized plastic items can also be put and it can be identified also. Yeah. So thank you. I hope uh, this answers your queries and uh, with this, uh, I have no further question from the student side. So thank you. Thank you, Madhu, once again. And uh, before closing, I would like to thank our director, Dr. P.C. Pancharya, for giving us this opportunity to organize Jigyasa Popular Lecture Series. Thank you very much, sir. Also, I would like to extend my thanks to Dr. Ravjit Karmakar, who is the architect behind this program. I thank Mr. Navjot Kumar and Dr. Madan Kumar Lakshmanan for their interesting talk. How hope many students have gained from today's lecture. I also thank uh, Dr. Anil Sani and Dr. Pramod Tavar for their uh, overall coordination for this program. And uh, one more announcement for the students that this is the first lecture of this popular lecture series. We have many more lectures in our bank and that will be uh, like we will organize in coming weeks. So we will keep you updated about this. So with this, I thank each and everyone. Have a great uh, day ahead. Happy Basant Panchami once again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much.